So I think we're in that state of searching for signals, right? Searching for, I mean, from an oil perspective, I think the signals are very clearly there from a macro perspective. But I guess that as well, if that's so clear, are we going to see it in the equity prices? Hi again, welcome to another market episode of World of Oil Derivatives. I'm Greg Newman, Group Chief Executive on its Capital Group, joined today by Vincent, James and Martha. Uh, please remember, as always, to like and subscribe to our channel uh, wherever you are, but particularly uh, YouTube as we are filming this, as always. Um, yeah, let's jump straight into it then. Uh, Martha, do you want to give us a summary on flat price then? Yeah, of course. Um, so flat price, we've seen Brent go up to almost but not quite 88 and now we're softening around down to 85. I don't think we're touching 85 yet, but it won't surprise me if we keep do seeing this decrease down through the day pessimistic as ever. Um, looking at the CFTC and the positioning of the market, we saw the third week of buying from managed by money positions in the weeks the 2nd of July. And now it's that's the highest weekly increase since March. So the market is pretty long now. And looking at the COT, if we could get the graph up afterwards, the COT graph with the CTA positioning, this is looking really long now as well. So I think there is a lot of room to fall off here from these lengths. I think especially when there just seems to be lacking a proper driver of like a proper reason and looking in like the fundamental macro. It seems like we're lacking a reason to see this really bullish attitude that we've had other than just that kind of will for the market to be bullish. Of course, we have seen a really bullish market in the physical data brand in the um, North Sea. But aside from that, looking at the actual like state of the oil market as a whole, um, the China demand is weaker. We've seen the VLCC um, for crews um, from the US to Asia fall about 20% since May. Um, we're, there seems this demand question, there's really weak economic data. German industrial production fell 2.5% in May to a level last seen in 2010, so really, really low, excluding COVID, and French industrial production fell really low as well. Um, but I mean, we are seeing the strength still in the physical, and we're still seeing refiner buying in the physical. Um, and the CFD curve is strong and in backwardation still. So it does all kind of seem quite disjointed. Um, I think a bit of the strength last week must have been this hurricane risk getting priced in um, before the hurricane hit. I mean, it's making landfall today, made landfall today in the States. Before that, we saw, I think, 10 deaths in the Caribbean, which is very sad, but it was the first Category 5, in like the earliest in the year, Category 5, and then Category 4. Um, and it's kicked off the season with a lot of speculation and a lot of comments about barrel, which is the name of it. Um, but I think there's little to be said for kind of how that's going to impact double TI, especially other than maybe if the um, export hubs are taken out by a different hurricane, then we could see some pressure in the spreads. That's the usual reaction. But I mean, I think just maybe this was just kind of the rhetoric of risk getting built in earlier in the week and with no payoff really. Yeah, I think, um, again, rewinding back to when we dipped below 80 um, a while back, you know, this is why it's worth, it's a bit like printing money on bonds, you know, like when you come in and uh, provide enough support, you can set the momentum back the other way if uh, in a lot of scenarios. And um, so I think the rally from kind of like 82 up to 88 that we've had in the past few weeks, you could probably, you know, initially we were very clear and it seemed to be driven from too many shorts, um, too little longs. So there's a decent kind of short squeeze there, but then the, the momentum carries, the CTAs kick in, it's, it's, it's as always. And I think with a lack of like clear narrative, um, kind of away from the bearish momentum story, the only thing next is kind of, I guess, trade technically, which is probably driving things at the moment. I think there's a lot to be said about like the momentum still kind of being there, but waning, as you just said at the end, uh, sorry, at the beginning. So like the last couple of days, we finally tapered off and... You know, I guess what we're waiting for is for some of this macro weakness we've been talking week in, week out, um, mainly from you, James, starting to filter in properly into the into the markets. So, OK, so we've arrested the kind of steady momentum increase in flat price and Brent flat price. Um, but we still got the summer ahead. As you said, we still got hurricanes. We still got excuses for people to be long. But then, God, hedge funds have just flipped all time short, all time long. It's it's yeah, it seems like they're very um like they more so than usual, they're moving from extreme position to the other, which which would indicate to me that there's a lot of technical traders out. There's a lot of CTA type traders because there's no like hard and fast reason. I, I think if you look back to manage money being this long and and previously that, that short, 
um, it would be because of a war, geopolitical situation, or something very macro orientated. For them to be max long in just a bullish rally, that's not that big of a deal. Strikes me as a lot of CTA positioning. Is that would you kind of align with that? I mean, certainly for my conversations with people in the market, people are much more moving towards systematic. It's the buzzword of the year and, and previous years recently. But all it really means is you're applying a CTA type mentality, um, just rules based kind of buying what everyone's buying and try and drive the momentum. That that seems to be a decent explanation for me. Yeah, what I noticed with the futures is it suddenly turned last Wednesday, Thursday, suddenly started to go down. That's when you had the really shocking ISM services data, which suddenly fell to a four year low. Yeah. And that would be risk parity guys kind of getting out of commodities to some extent, if that's what's driving their models, right? Macroeconomic data is likely to be from these guys. Uh, also, global macro yeah. fund managers just saying, you know, we've got to start looking at more aggressive cuts from the Fed. Yeah. The, the data's weakening. Yeah. And then it kind of then takes... Then it's with Friday's payroll data coming out again, weaker than expected. Then you take everyone out of this like nice smooth trend. So the trend traders are out as well. So it's a decent explanation for why the kind of increase has been arrested, if you like. And now where do we go from here? I guess that's that's the discussion. So... Um, just before we talk about the macro, because I think that is clearly like very important. I think for me, like, um, you know, we're talking about the underlying markets. Does it justify the strength and did it justify the we thought we were falling off a cliff? You know, sentiment was like really giving way to a like very strong, fundamentally bearish view, it seemed. And then all of a sudden we had, um, you know, basically a short squeeze and some decent buying in the North Sea. And now we're all the way back up. And um, the time spreads, you know, heading towards a dollar. We expired really strong last month. Uh, the CFD curve, everything's in backwardation. It would indicate, like as a snapshot, that, it, you know, the market is justifiably strong. But we know that can be just a, uh, just a, a positioning thing, right? It, it may not last at all. If anything, it could be propped up and ready to go. So we need to start looking. If that's what we think, we need to start looking for other signals. So I guess a lot of them are going to come from the macro. But before we say that... You've got to look at like the last sell off was heavily margin driven, it seems, right? A lot of models, again, uh, people more and more trading that way are looking at these kind of binary fundamental signals, refinery margins being weak. That killed uh, the sentiment last time. How are we looking on margins this time? Is it you, Vincent? Yes. Uh, yeah. So I think this rally was not necessarily driven by uh, margins because that still remains quite sluggish. Yeah. Um, that's in both uh, diesel and gasoline. So in diesel, gas oil, um, there was a rally in previous weeks, but again, that seems to be pos more positioning and flow driven rather than um, rather than anything else. The crack rallied from 18 to uh, $22 per barrel spreads flipped from contango into backwardation, but the past week has seen um, the structure reverse. So the so spreads have moved back into uh, contango once again. So again, it seems that the market is very much driven by this herdy mentality this year more than we've seen in in the previous while. Um, if you want to attribute it to, to a fundamental reason, that could be weaker diesel demand from China, milder than expected temperatures around Europe. And then there's also the balance of weakness in freight industrial activity, which um, diesel is quite uh, quite sensitive to their business cycle and as James is talking about weak ISM data all that would have uh, negative influence on uh, gas oil prices but the other one big one was uh, hurricane bill and how, how that affects the gasoline market the debate is is a hurricane bullish or bearish for um, for oil prices or gasoline prices for gasoline um, risks to supply disruption that would be a bullish factor but then once it makes landfall, that would be bearish for uh, demand. So it's a comparison between that. Yeah, um, but generally speaking, the market is weighted long, hoping that gasoline would drive the demand this year, but also the chances of supply disruption from not just hurricanes, but refiners overheating and things like that. So we have to acknowledge that this hurricane, a real hurricane, real impact, Category 5, you know, that's... That is a materialization of what we were, what the market generally was expecting. So I think it's a bit of a crass thing to say, but in a way, the market's happy with that. So, um, okay, that's gone as planned. So I think, I think we were saying about it last week, I believe we're in a state of, you know, we market wanting to see the summer out strong. And that's it, just wanting to survive it where we are. So it doesn't need to rally extraordinarily well. It just needs to stay where it is, price out you know, incrementally 
uh, stronger in the next couple of months and then it will be job done. So it strikes me that also as you're talking, it kind of would make sense for the people, you know, doubling down, tripling down, quadrupling down kind of below 80. And, and when we were on this like seemingly momentum driven decline to suddenly reverse it, you know, you've just doubled down. So it'd be a great time to take profit once you're six, seven dollars higher. So I think uh, if I just go generically off the expectations at the beginning of the year, ninety dollars was where I think a lot of people were hoping that Brent would get to. And uh, just before that, for people to be taking profit makes a lot of sense, especially when you just avoided like a steep uh, decline and it's not it's looking a little bit shaky. So I would say we're in like peak profit taking um, uh, territory. And then when you have a hurricane, it's ideal for the slower, you know, bigger trader like the trade houses and the majors, because like the fast money is proving, the hedge fund money is proving going from max short to max long in such a brief period. Yeah. on a reaction to hurricane like Martha says or whatever it is. This is why people call them dumb money, because it's like, well, you know, they're generically long or they're generically short. They are taking their time over these things. So when someone just buys on something like, to be honest, quite flippant and they're not really thinking about, is it genuinely bullish sustainably? So how, how is it really going to drive prices sustainably from 82, 83 dollars per, uh, per barrel on Brent to like 90? That's a big jump for inflation, for demand, all that kind of thing. If it happens in a short period of time, I think the trade houses and majors are going to go, like, thanks for the free money. You know, like, I'm out of this now, or I'm going to use it as a liquidation event. And I think we'll start to see more of that. So I think, particularly in Arbol, particularly in Brent, not so much gas, oil, and diesel, because I think that's been weak all year. We're going to see, like, every rally potentially sold into. So I just don't see the risk reward being that great, um, kind of on the long side. But that, that said, if there's things that are relative value, like um, what could be supported versus things. So, for example, you remember that hurricane we talked about a case study quite a lot of times with uh, or like the colonial pipeline, for example, when it goes down, OK, things are bullish, generically bullish. But, you know, where is the position positioning maxed out? Where is it? You know, it might actually be a relative thing. So looking at like Arbol versus Ebol prices or East West positioning is probably going to be where the money is, like the incremental increases in gasoline prices relative to regions. I think that's where, where there'll be some interesting money because I still get the impression from the traders that pricing is still sluggish in Europe, um, everything is just like based on like a macro position somewhere. It doesn't actually mean anything. So looking at just the outright refinery margin number in Europe, let's say, what, where, where are we on that? Uh, around 650 in M1. Okay, so if we're around 650, okay, you got it there. So yeah, I mean, that's not too bad, right? I mean, obviously it's a massive just estimation. We're just benchmarking product prices there. It could be very different yields in, in a few different places, but generically speaking, that is profitable. And it doesn't matter how profitable, right? If a refiner is profitable, they're just going to be running at max. It doesn't make sense any, any other way. So that is quite bullish still. So it's not like the market's breaking down with the current crude prices, which you would expect if it was overly propped up, right? And so that is quite interesting. Let me start maybe looking at the forward curve. Um, and if people start aggressively hedging Q4, for example, not expecting this demand to follow through, then if they're hedging the current profitable levels, then it actually also means that a lot of products will come online no matter what happens, which means that we should be looking for the signal of kind of a structural reversal probably coming from products again, because crude can hold up if refineries are buying and ultimately there's logistic constraints. It's only going to get worse with the hurricanes. If you can't send WTI over, then it's it's kind of bullish and we'll see. Yeah, and we saw that 1.3% increase in the refinery utilization in the States in the last release compared to like the 0.2% or something forecast. So mm. I think they're definitely making hay whilst the sun shines. Yeah, well, yeah. But you see my point, if we are genuinely weak, yeah, fundamentally, then, then the products have to overwhelm the crew. And if we don't see that, then why? how can you really say crude is propped up? I mean, that's my hypothesis, but I don't need to start seeing those signals to really actually believe it, I think. But it's lead lag, right? Sometimes you can just, you can get the, the faltering of demand uh, before you can actually see it in the paper. It's the actually reverse. Sometimes the physical does lead uh, the paper and the paper is just getting ahead of itself and it's elevated against the physical. That that might happen. So we just got to keep an eye. But then on all that all that note, you know, the demand story, James. So Macro Mondays yesterday, like it's just, again, your kind of consistent theme of weak data in the US and Europe just seems to be continuing, right? Yeah, last week it took actually another leg week of the data. Three key pieces of data. ISM manufacturing came in weak than expected again. That's been in contraction for 20 out of the last 21 months. 
But the key piece really was ISM services. So services have been keeping the US economy going. They've been strength there. It's three times bigger than the manufacturing sector. And it suddenly plummeted to a four-year low from expansion at 52.7 to 48.8 contraction. If you drill into it, the data was actually even worse. Business activity slumped from 61.2 to 49.6. And new orders slumped from 54.1 to 47.3. So just breaking these down a bit, so I, ISM, sorry, what does that mean again? Institute of Supply Chain Managers, Okay. previously known as Purchasing Managers Index. So it's a forward-looking survey of businesses, basically, and it's highly correlated uh, with a lead to GDP. And so there's a government production. organization that calls around companies that manufacture yes. and say, what is your existing yes. kind of rate? And it's a key, yeah, and it's, it's, as I say, it's a key lead indicator because it's highly correlated to how GDP but how, but how do they come up with 48.5? It's basically expansion is above 50, contraction is below 50. Okay. So, Roger. So, 20 out of the last 21 months and the lowest since COVID. Yes. I mean, that's pretty disastrous. So, there's new orders are slumping. So, the US isn't manufacturing. So, what, and, and well, it makes sense. Payroll is being weak. People can't pay because the jobs aren't coming through. So, manufacturing is about what? how much of the US economy? A quarter. And services. Service sector is three quarters. And why is no one talking about this, really? It's not. Well, then, actually, the ISM chairperson Miller came out afterwards and said that the US economy is now in contraction for the first time in 17 months. But the, I mean, I'm not so wrong. Like, this is not getting talked about in wider circles. No one said this in any oil reports. I mean, it is always shockingly bad, and then it shocks me that it is shocking because yeah. it's happening every week, and why is everyone right. not... The end is not, you know. And then if actually if we go on to the further data, the payrolls on Thursday, jobless claims and continuing claims were weaker than expected. But payrolls, the headline came in just above expectations. But if you look again, drill down to detail, it's far worse. So the headline beat by 26,000, but the previous two months were revised down 111,000. Um, the unemployment rate jumped to 4.1%. Now, just two weeks ago, the Fed said they expect unemployment to stay at 4% to year-end. Um, again, it gets worse. The last 12 months, full-time jobs have fallen 1.55 million. And of the jobs created, two-thirds in the last 12 months of jobs created, two-thirds have been government and healthcare. Jesus, you're relishing these stats. <laughs> yeah. I guess you were calling for it, but that's the thing. So, okay, but something else that doesn't get reported yeah. enough is that monetary policy has a six to nine month lag. So even if the Fed cut in September, which is there's 20 basis points of cuts price, so 80% chance they cut in September, we're not going to see that stimulate the economy till at earliest second half. Wow. Oh, sorry, second quarter of next year. Okay, so pretty doom and gloom. From an oil perspective, we would expect this with the refinery margins being where they are. Where they are, um, we we should be seeing we should be seeing some pretty aggressive product builds. It's probably what we'd say. Refinery reutilization up, making hay where the sun shines, like Martha says, but the demand not there. I mean, how are, we are we are building one week and then drawing a next. So, like, is there any? Well, there was there was a larger than expected draw in gasoline and distillates. Um, and a huge draw in crude of 12 million barrels, um, which is, you know, breathtaking. But I think there's lots of talk that that's also, you've got to consider the EIA um, adjustment factor, which is a lot, lot higher for last week than in previous weeks. I think it's up from like 0.2 to like 1 point something. So it's just a really significant draw and it's much larger than expected. And to see that draw in distillates, um, which, you know, we weren't expecting either. It is hard to rationalise because if refinery utilisation, 1% is a decent, that's a decent uptake. Yeah. But all absorbed, more than absorbed, they actually had to board all the products mm -hmm. and drew on the, on the, on the existing uh, inventory. So, yeah, the theory of demand, well, if demand is so bad, um, why aren't we seeing it in the stocks? And that's why I come back, we always talk about this lagged data concept. So when was the ISM kind of calculated? Uh, this was for the previous month, so this was for June. Yeah, so is, is it possible then that it could be on the uptick again? I mean, demand is picking up again. I mean, just from an oil perspective, that's what it looks like, right? 
I guess the manufacturing is those being continued contraction yeah. and that came in weaker than expected. Yeah. So this can just definitely be putting down to some extent driving season, you know, to some extent. But then the weekly demand figures, um, I don't know if I say his name, the gas buddy guy. Yeah, sure, of says, course, of course. Um, shout out. Um, they're coming in every week lower than expected, lower than last week and lower than like the forecast to be. Oh, I actually remember you talking about this. So um, it, there just doesn't seem to be. How can we be drawing then? Where are they putting it all? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But the economic data tends to trend. Yeah. So right. you might get short term draws, but the longer term trend seems to be one way now. So I think we're in that state of searching for signals, right? Searching for, I mean, from an oil perspective, I think the signals are very clearly there from a macro perspective. But I guess that as well, if that's so clear, are we going to see it in the equity prices? Vincent, something you mentioned earlier is you're reading that commodity now, there's more demand for expectations of Fed cuts. Yeah, which, which actually ironically means that weak um, economic data is a bullish thing in terms of commodities mm. because people are pricing in the future, they're expecting rate cuts, which yeah. will stimulate future demand. But you're pricing, you're pricing the impact of the rate cuts right now, but the impact doesn't happen until six or nine months down the road. So, But that's only the case when you have unbalanced positioning. If you're already long and the money managers and they respond to, to cuts, then they can't buy more than they've already bought, right? So I, I hear your point, but I don't, you know, they can't keep buying. So I don't think that's going to be an impact. I suspect the global macro reacts to the actual data and says we're heading towards a recession. Yeah, yeah. Demand should fall. Okay. Just as one of those things, you know, do you remember in the big short where he says, um, uh, I wasn't wrong, I was just too early. So like, that's the same thing. It takes so long to play out. It takes long to play out and you're always going, I don't want to miss this. And like, this is going to happen. And I've seen so many traders, including myself, be like panicking, like I'm going to miss this. And then like you do it and it doesn't happen for like a year. And then you probably you probably miss it anyway. So you gotta I think you've got to be disciplined in a scenario like this to be like, if your but if your view is bearish and considering things like OPEC as well, non-OPEC supply increasing, and then the macro is the is the driver, you do, we do have to I think you do the diligent trader will have to see it in the price the price action or at least the fundamental indicators that are systematically driving prices or at least there's evidence of that before you start piling in. Because to do it now, as I said, when we're drawing in gasoline in the US even and refinery utilization up, those are great demand figures. Even though the gas buddy figures are saying the demand's low, even though the macro thing is saying it's low, you have to go off what the, the oil market doesn't care about your opinion, right? It doesn't care about your sentiment. It's, gonna, it's just gonna show the data it's gonna show. Is there an element of, like you're saying, the EIA making adjustment factors? Is there, is there an element of the data being wrong to some extent? They're not, there's not 100% truth in data, right, at all times, especially when they're global, right? So that, that might be a case. But I think we have to see it in things like the refinery margins, right? Like it, refiners can still sell that 650 number, let's say it's around there, in the forward market. And they can still run crude all day long at that level, lock it in. And even if refinery margins go to minus 10, They've locked it in at 650 and they can keep running. So that's bullish demand crude. Um, but if you're not, if that's the case and you're not seeing a, a, a significant weakening of refinery margins, then by definition, the market can hold up where it is for a sustained period. So it'd be very dangerous to pick your moment now. However, the market is very long positioning. Um, it depends how long term your view is. And we are we do look to have faltered on this um, drive up to 90. So yeah. Looking for signals, it's probably the name I of the podcast. I guess they're looking for signals with the EIA stats, the more outlandish they are and the larger the adjustment factor is, the less of that signal that the market's going to take that and the more that we're going to have to look for other fundamental signals outside of the EIA. That's actually a very good point. I mean, exactly. like A bit like you said with the Fed cuts. It is arbitrary how people really respond to things. They could respond to like the increase in my belt buckle at the end of the day, right? Co correlation <laughs> versus causation. If they want to do that and enough people do it, it will impact the price. So it's just about the narrative right now. And for whatever reason, the macro, there's this perfect thing to say, because it's like all these things can go on, but if no one wants to trade off that, then it's not going to impact it for a very, very, very long time. So when we've had these bubbles that we've talked about in the past. It's only like they can, it can stay irrational way longer than solvency, right? That's the, that's the saying. And I think that's, that's what makes it so hard to trade contrarian, I think. But also as the price action starts to go down, then you should see more of the speculative money jump on that and start to sell. Yeah, you should see that position just start purely to by price action. You can start to grow. You can let the market yeah. tell you because the fundamentals say it should go down, and the price yeah. action starts to confirm it. Yeah, and the 
the more diligent traders will. Well, the fun, I think the fundamentals are telling us, or the indicators are telling us, that we should start to see weakness in oil indicators. But we, we haven't yet. Is that fair to say? The only one I can think of is, is reading this morning about um, freight rates decreasing, I think, to China. Uh, less imports. And that, that would make sense. Um, but then again, I would say, yeah, because Brent Dubai is a lot stronger, data Dubai is a lot stronger. Um, data Brent prices are probably elevated right now. So why would they be buying those elevated prices? They're going to buy more local things like Eastern Siberia, uh, ESPO. They're going to be buying um, WAF. And you see what I mean? So then, of course, the freight rates are going to go down because they're going to import more locally. Yeah. And we've heard this China demand story being weak for so long as well. I guess the market's not going to react that viciously to it. Um, yeah. that we've seen, you know, all eyes are really on India, as everyone always says. But this is, this is, it. This is what we love talking about. It's the power of storytelling, the power of psychology. So no one wants to tell a compelling, bearish story right now. It's very hard to fight against the entire industry that is consensus bullish, consensus long. And hedge funds have obviously bought into that. And there's clearly like a, a decent supporting level from the bigger traders when we went below 80. But then, of course, OPEC are fighting the narrative as well. And at the moment, you know, people will take, you know, OPEX kind of tweets a lot more seriously than like a, a tweet from a research house being like, I'm bearish, you know? So we, it's, it's about that. And people, these guys know this, right? So that book, Oil Leaders, Al Mahana, like they know what they're doing, right? They say it's half fundamentals, half um, psychology, sometimes even more. And you have to go on a campaign if you want the price to be lower or higher. You need to really get in people's heads. The market should be lower at, or higher. And uh, so I think if you're fighting against that, you just... If you think it will turn because the market just cannot sustain itself, then you might as well wait until you get 100% of those signals because it's not going to be so flip. The market's not going to be so flippant. You see what I'm trying to say? Barring a big equity sell-off is the only thing I'd add that. That is a big, like you can't fight like a macro macro sell-off, right? And do you think that's coming? Typically that comes when the Fed start cutting. So it's a statistic I've mentioned several times before that the low in the S&P, if you go back to 1970, the low in the S&P is 11 months after the first Fed cut. Yeah. So when the Fed start cutting, then equities start to fall because the equity market says we're heading towards a recession. What does that do for profits? And we talked about recession, like the, the recession that never came all last year. But these are real recession signals that we didn't get last year. Is that fair to Absolutely. say? Absolutely. And at so the beginning of the year, the, the market was pricing six cuts, 160 basis points of cuts. Then that went all the way back to just 25 basis points when yeah. the market had priced a recession that didn't occur. Mm. But now the data is suddenly trending in that direction. Just a word on that as well. Um, obviously a small market in the UK, but that's why I felt like a sterling hedge was appropriate because ultimately if, if we need to be buying sterling generally, to buy it forward now would make sense because um, against the dollar, the US has had its sustained rally. It's had its like very, very strong period. And now we're getting the indicators that it's weak. And now we get the volatility around the election where the UK has just done the opposite, right? It's just got a centrist like kind of um, government in that's like primary priority is just stability, right? And surely markets are going to respond better to that than the US situation. And given we've been on a long-term decline from sterling, I know I'm, I'm zooming out now and going back to like the last 12 years has just been on that like big decline this could be a pretty decent against the dollar resurgence, or at least I don't see much downside for sterling, just for the UK people, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. And the same yeah. against the euro. Oh, really? Because the euro, oh, yeah, the of course, weakness with France, the France, the German did... economy, which Martha mentioned earlier, French elections. Yes, but that kind of got, well, some interesting stuff going on in the French elections, but yeah, you're right. German, German um, data is getting worse and worse and worse, right? No, good point. Okay. Uh, speaking of narratives, um, Googling oil, what is everyone talking about? So, um, speaking of a bearish narrative, the biofuel growth engine has stalled. Okay. So, um, recently there's been some news that uh, Shell has um, temporarily, temporarily suspended construction work at its biofuels facility in Netherlands um, amid weakening biofuel margins. Same with BP, they scale back plans in uh, for two of its biofuel uh, facilities. Finland's Neste, the world's leading producer of sustainable aviation fuel and uh, biodiesel, has warned on profits last month. Its stock has fallen um, by from 50 to 20 euros year on year. So this, of course, underscores the challenges that the biodiesel bio uh, green jet fuel market has been facing because it's much more expensive compared to traditional uh, fossil fuels. And also um, European imports of cheap Chinese products have 
um, reduced uh, the profitability of local uh, producers. So EU's also investigating alleg- allegations of uh, dumping. So yes, uh, there's a clear bearish narrative, narrative in the biodiesel, despite all the talks about the energy transition. Yeah, and it's not coming just yet. Well, our power guys are talking a very bearish game. The fundamentally, the power market doesn't look strong. Uh, it's had spikes in the front, and there's been issues in Europe, yada yada. But it's the carbon price they just can't see as sustainable because ultimately it was a long-term trend and it's seen really as a tax, right? So uh, when we're so weak in Germany in particular, the demand's just not there. You know, who is going to be buying like expensive carbon credits to fund kind of a, a renewable story when, as you say, fossil fuel prices are so cheap? Um, and that's only going to get worse with a recession, right? Ultimately, in recessions, I'm assuming, you know, fossil fuels the cheapest products always going to be used, right? So we, you probably revert back to coal and things like that in recessions would be my guess. I don't know if that's data backs that up, but um, just to add to that. Okay. And what else? I guess they're talking about, people are talking about the hurricane. Yeah. Probably still um, drone strikes. There was another one today. Actually, Russia, I was talks about Russia actually striking Ukraine this time. Yes. Um, so we, but we're still getting the drones. I think the drones is not too sure about recently, but it seems that well, it's not on headlines. The headlines, I mean. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been perhaps like markets been priced have priced that in, mm. um, unless there's something. There's a significant um, headline. Um, there's also uh, as um, as we mentioned earlier about cheaper freight prices. Um, Russian oil deliveries keep getting cheaper despite sanctions. So. In a sense, we're talking about um, the freight cost from Russia's uh, Black Sea port of Novorossiysk uh, has fallen to its lowest since uh, last October. So from Black Sea port to uh, to China, the freight route. So in a sense, it uh, allows this allows Russia to get more revenue from every barrel of oil sold to Asian uh, customers. So um, this won't be pleasing to the G7 countries that have set those. Uh, target of these sanctions towards Russia and its uh, shadow fleet because, in a sense, this helps uh, increase Russian revenue on a relative value basis. But also, um, yeah, it's just talking, just two stories here. One is sanctions and two, reducing freight costs, which also, in, this, in part, is due to weaker demand from Asia, from China. It's probably also- from that region, though. Sorry, go on. I'm oh, sorry. It's probably also worth mentioning that President Modi, Indian president, was visiting Moscow yesterday and today Mm. to try and establish a long-term arrangement for Russian oil into Mm. India as well. So that kind of matches the story well. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out. I can understand India more from the Black Sea port, right? But I think China is going to, it's got the short haul for crude uh, on the, in the eastern side. So I don't, I don't know why China has been roped into this story so much, or at least the whole lower freight story. That's, that's, kind of what I'm thinking, but at the same time, I get it. So they're going to increase from Saudi and they're going to increase from Russia on the eastern side. They're not going to be buying more from Europe while they do that, right? Yeah. So maybe it's like, into yeah. India makes sense, though. Mm. I think it's worth touching on. I don't think we've got anything to really say, like, with any conviction, but Labour government at, and the US government, I think they're the leaders, and Europe are, of course, but, like, in general, this fight on the sanction sides with oil, with Russia... It does seem to be petering away. There's enough distraction that it doesn't have to be the focus. And I would say, as a Labour government, if you believed that it is a bit futile, then um, in a way you can blame that on the previous government, right? And you can, I'm not saying not doing any, do anything about it, but they don't need, as in, to make further action is going to be very costly and timely without much impact would be my kind of superficial take on it. So in essence, I think it looks more and more likely that People just giving up on the sanctions idea with oil. I mean, what do they? What do ministers and leaders believe they can do in Europe and um, US any further from this point? I don't know, but it's probably worth looking into next because, yeah, a new uh, set of regimes. Like let's say Trump does get into power. Let's say uh, we've got the French elections. We've now got the Labour government. What what is their take going to be? Especially if you add uh, Italy to that. You know, there's like more sentiment away from sanctions. I would think growing, but even if you took away sanctions. I am not sure that much would change personally from an oil perspective. The oil routes have all been rerouted. I don't think the Russians are suffering at all. I think they'd much rather have Eastern flows anyway. Uh, but then natural gas is a very different story. I think from, again, anecdotally, I can't back it up, but I think I read that um, 
gas imports are massively on the increase again in Germany from Russia. Um, and you know, realistically, if you're going to go into a recession, and there's, it's probably likely going to add to like the peace talk side of things and how we actually materialize in the next few years. If economic weakness is going to be that bad, that why would you keep paying essentially for these sanctions that are just clearly not working and actually the Russians are winning out of it? That's that's something I think we'll, we'll look and at. You're hurting more. in Germany's case. You're hurting your economy even more. Uh, that's probably what triggered it anyway, right? The cheap energy story and then like the high skilled staff from Eastern Europe are kind of staying in Eastern Europe and there's things around. Yeah. So this is this is going to be this is going to be um, more and more interesting throughout uh, the rest of the year. But I'm a f- it's fair to conclude that, right? I mean, what 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 do we actually expect if a headline came out right now that there was peace talks and sanctions are going to be eased in oil? Would it make any difference? Possibly bearish, right? Just just from a sentiment perspective, easier to flow oil. I don't know. Okay, um, our trade idea for the week. Trade idea would be um, we do suggest to buy the RBOP crack as a hurricane trade. Actually looking at the um, latest CFTC the other for RBOP futures, mm. um, shorts are at their highest level since uh, 2017. So higher than COVID just from an outright basis, indicating markets and at least in the futures getting overcrowded towards the sell side. And with all the market sentiment wanting to uh, talk up the summer summer demands or about the weather risk. Um, it could be dangerous to uh, be dangerous to go go short. And if there was some real material disruption, then we could see a lot of further short covering flows. Yeah. So I said, like, I think outright buying the crack. Would, I just don't think the risk rewards there. Right. Is in a lot of people are still banking on that. But I see your point. So something relative value, I think, would make sense. So this is July swap close to my August. Um, that would be uh, the front month top crack. So let's top say RBOP crack. But this is a swap crack. So if you say yep. August RBOP swap, mm. right? So that's you can just let it price out that as a crack. So that against Brent, if you held that against say Q4, or that as a crack roll, basically, uh, it does give you exposure to like bearish Brent. But I think. You're going to get that still. You're still going to get that relative upside if a hurricane kicks off. You, mm. It's also got the. Um, it's also going to be supported by bullish traders into pricing, and a lot of the industry kind of banking on it. But it doesn't give you that like beta uh, kind of exposure that even the biggest oil traders can't protect against. Right? If there's a big macro sell-off, mm. you know, you, the majors and trade houses can't um, prop up an arbob crack in that basis. It's just too much volume. But they can on a relative basis. To other things so you'll see it very commonly um data brand for example like their, their positions are too big right so they have a massive long position but they know the market's getting weaker so rather than sell what they've got because that would absolutely decimate their own position they just start selling more deferred and overselling so as the long start pricing out that they can to some extent support um it becomes a relative value thing so if they if they just like keep it slightly elevated on a relative basis to the deferred market. Once that price is out, you're now short and then it can give way and then you're happy. And that, that's a very common thing for big book traders to do. So they don't, they don't, they basically can't turn around their book without it really hurting themselves. You see what I'm getting at? That's interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. So selling, selling in the deferred. Um, yeah. Well, in a weird way, it's bullish to spreads, but it's not actually a bullish thing. It's just a relative value trade because it's like, that can be propped up relative to the third, but you don't want the beta correlation because if you just outright get long, it's you, you've got the weight of the world kind of to take on, which yeah. you only want to do when everything lines up. You see what I mean? Mm. So it's like going, um, you, you want the longs in the front to price out, but then going short in the back. And if there was like a very bearish macro event, then you can also capture that too. So Yeah, and weirdly, it, it's bullish to spread. So in COVID, I remember the first month it really started to take off. I believe it was like March when people started to accept it. So it probably would have been, May or maybe even June, July, Brent spreads. I think it was May, June though. And, you know, the research agencies are, okay, well, obviously it's, it's going to be bearish. The um, We're going to see an inventory build of this. That's going to correlate to a uh, time spread of minus 30 or whatever. But it's Brent expiry. And ultimately, if everyone is long, like you're talking like hundreds of millions of barrels long this time spread, it's buying one month versus selling the other. They can still like, basically provide some buying support into pricing, into expiry, knowing that once that price is off, they've got the short leg to be short on. So actually what happened was it expired at like plus 30. And oh, oh, that means it's bullish. It's not. It's just relative. You see what I mean? So if you'd sold that spread 
it would have been so frustrating, but you would have lost money, even in a business. It's just trade expression is such a big part of the game, right? Um, good stuff. All right, so the poll we did last week, we said, what is the most bullish factors for summer oil demand? Is it extreme weather, summer travel season, PMI data, manufacturing, or the weaker dollar? And most people, 46% said summer travel season. Um, yeah, that's that's in line, I guess, with our expectations. But 30% said extreme weather. And that's clearly, you know, everyone's got the same view here. Hurricanes coming in, hot weather expected. It's a relative it's a relative value narrative almost as well. So, yeah, not many people thought it was anything other than those two things. I would say all this. We know what we expect summer travel season to be. And at the moment, the data is suggesting, actually, that it's more likely to be weaker than expected. Yeah. There's, but it's it's multi-pronged, right? So it's in like that's retail sales and that's like macroeconomic indicators. But you know, ruthlessly looking at pricing of oil and the stocks, which would drive it the most, would be that it's absolutely. okay right yeah. now. It's not to say it won't happen, but I still think there might be an argument, like to flip the narrative a little bit, that maybe that data is what's lagging. But you're saying it trends. You're you're pretty confident it's going to continue. I hear you, uh, but I'm just saying devil's advocate. If the prompt data, which is, you know, this week is saying this or like for last week, let's say, and you're going back a month for that bearish data, there could be an element of maybe it's just a spike in demand increase. So what I'm saying is, if what you're saying is correct, I think we should start seeing the material like, impact of that on the oil market in the next month or two. And then that will be super bearish because you're going right. The, the macro is finally starting to feed into fundamental indicators. Now are we going to see that filtering into paper price action, which is not the same thing at all. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting, interesting couple months. Um, I think we'll leave it there. And thanks everyone again for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate your support. See you again soon.